Hey friends, Dustin here from Vintage King, and today we have a very special conversation between Mr. Warren Hewitt and Mark Daniel Nelson from the incredible Produce Like a Pro YouTube channel. We're gonna be unpacking and looking at all the obstacles that present themselves when producing and making music in our home studio environments. We're gonna be talking what gear we should be looking at and considering, acoustic treatment, and even effective time management skills. Let's jump into it. All right, so let's go way back. Let's talk about long before you guys were the YouTube superstars you've become today, long before uh, recording professionally. You know, when you guys were first starting off recording on your own, what were some early obstacles that you struggled with and how did you overcome them or eventually maybe learn to embrace them? Mark, you can go first on this one. <laughs> well, I try and think back? of a good answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, that's... Uh, well, thanks for having me, Dustin. I think the biggest thing is, starting out, like for me, it was during an era pre-computers. I mean, there was computers, but there wasn't a fast enough computer to do a proper session in 1994 for me to be able to access that. So being inspired with playing music as a guitarist or a piano player, then you can actually care more about the music and focus on that. So when you mess up and you're working on a four track, you just do it again. And then you practice so much that you get better and better at it. And by the time your, your performance is great, you don't really even focus on the sound. So who cares about the sound? No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't know. I mean, the biggest thing I could say is it's it's been a constant upward long-term journey to try to achieve the best kind of sound you have in your head. But technology keeps advancing, which it makes it easier, but it's also making it incredibly difficult. I was reading a book yesterday or this morning about Rodney Jenkins, who's super famous R&B guy, talking about the the transition of his life working on analog versus digital and how it just went downhill with digital, which is weird because his credits are like modern R&B and stuff. It's not like classic analog. So it can totally limit you if you have a bass amp simulator or a compressor on every channel or stuff like that. I think by learning what one thing does a billion times and getting really good at it, is going to always make you better at it than is if you have seven versions of an 1176 or Pro Tools or UAD Luna or, you know, Orion, whatever converter, whatever chain you have. It's, it's, I don't, I, I don't have an answer for that other than it's just, you have to really obviously find your passion, but get over the passion and, just practice. I, I hate the term of a pro is 10,000 hours into what they do, but I really do believe that. And that going into it, if you're a musician and you're musical, that's even better. I don't think that made any sense, but... No, it's a great answer. It's just the idea of work with what you have. I mean, it's so easy to fall into the gear loss, gear acquisition syndrome, but chances are you might already have something that can do the job. You just haven't fully explored it yet. Well, it's like the first thing I ever did buying a compressor. It took me a year and a half to even hear what compression was doing, period. That's before you even start getting into VCA bass versus FET bass versus Verimu bass versus optical bass and understanding why you're choosing those. So you just start with compressor, same with EQ or preamp, understanding gain stage, and then you can kind of really focus on the color of what a transformer is doing in a gain amp. Same as a compression circuit versus, you know, compressor being fired off with a light cell versus a tube burning out or a FET resistor, whatever you want to call it, that's fighting and doing whatever it's doing. Once you get to that place, you'll understand why and what it's doing, and then you can kind of jump to the next thing. Even in plugins, you can kind of decide, okay, I like this compressor. And sometimes the GUI, whatever you want to call it, is making you think it's something different than it is. But in general, once you kind of understand the philosophy behind it or the physics behind certain elements, then you're going to be great. Which is why, like for me, going into certain internships and mentorships in the beginning helped me 
and learn and for me to kind of throw off or pass along the information I learned from was kind of why I wanted to start doing videos and stuff anyways because I was granted enough to be able to be told tricks and they gave me a lot of advice and I didn't have to screw around to learn certain things and there's just not a area in 2020 2021 now that you have a luxury to be able to go and sit with some superstar engineer like you used to be able to and literally sit and ask them questions about why certain things are not you know working so I think it's important and crucial that education is just as equal as learning on your own and finding out and practicing and failing. So that's my answer. <laughs> I keep going for hours on it, but that's pretty much it. Warren, what about you, man? Uh, thinking back, you know, early years, just getting into recording, you know, tracking in your bedroom of your parents' house. What were some early challenges for you? Um, well, a couple of things. I, I... I left home at 16, so most of my experiences were um, living in bedsits and, you know, um, sharing places with other people. And um, so, yeah, I didn't really, I, the, the stuff I did at home was really peripheral, it wasn't even four track, it was two cassettes. I had uh, um, my dad's uh, Philips um, cassette deck, you remember the ones that were like, you know, an oblong, a rectangle, and they came in like a black leather case with holes in it. And you had just one control. It was zip, zip, play, stop, fast forward, rewind. Crazy, it would, crazy. It thing. would eject like this? Yep. Yep. I think they were the first ones, the Philip, Philips, because they invented the compact cassette. So it was the Philips compact cassette player. And so I had that, my dad's old stereo. And so I would, I would record guitar onto the Philips compact cassette, take that out, put it in the stereo, play it back through the speakers and with another cassette in the Philips, then record an overdub and I'd go backwards and forwards and, you know, maybe five or six, seven, eight times and try to build harmonies and, you know, because I wanted to be Brian May as a kid. So try and build harmony guitar parts with my limited knowledge of the blues scale. And of course, most of it was by the end of it with but um, it was fun. I think as you as as Mark was talking there, I was thinking to myself, one of the one of the blessings we have is actually coming up that way. Somebody asked me yesterday uh, a, a similar question, and I love studios. I love proper recording studios. I tried my darndest to build the best recording studio I possibly could. You know, for myself, I even still have an SSL but my I wonder as a musician some of my first experiences in recording studios were absolutely phenomenal but as soon as I came in as an engineer having already made a ton of records in a home or a cheaper environment I actually found I was running circles around some of the assistants and I realized what was happening was the assistants were starting off from recording studios with bands that had sold millions of records. And I would say to them, can you do an edit? And they'd be like... <clears throat> and I'd just be like, I'd, I'd be like, you know what, I'll, I'll engineer the session and do the editing, it's fine. Because I realized that one of the blessings of learning outside of a traditional studio system is I had to figure out how to make things sound good. Because now, of course, I'll put a mic up in a, in, a, in a garage on a drum kit and think it's the greatest drum sound ever. Because the drum, you know, I'm not worried so much about uh, what I'm thinking is like, this is a unique sound. But when I was a kid, if I put a mic up in a drum, I'd be like, this sounds like crap. Why doesn't it sound like the records that I'm hearing on the radio? Now I'd put it up and go, wow, this is the coolest drum sound. This room is so unique. And all I'd be doing as a, as, a, as a more accomplished engineer now is figuring out how to dampen down the cymbals. I'd be putting, like, you know, like a, a kitchen towel taped underneath the cymbals and telling the, telling the drummer not to hit them so hard or, you know, all those things. Or even saying, let's take the cymbals off the kit and just do kick and snare and overdub them. That's all the acquired knowledge I have. But at the time, it sounded like crap. So I, that's how I learned all of these other techniques. So it's quite... I think if you're watching this and you are at home or you've got 
whatever you've got, you know, whether you've got Pro Tools first or whatever the beginner's one's called now or Ableton or FL Studio or whatever, you know, whatever you've got, it doesn't matter. The creativity is really all that's important. And um, it's something I'm really big on. And, you know, reason why I've been focusing on a lot of video content on things like the Stooges, talking of Detroit, you know, and bands like that that were just making records any way they could. Um, and then, you know, I just interviewed Hugh Padgham and he talks about the famous drum sound, of course. And all that all that is, is what used to be, you know, a ten dollar microphone. It was a it's a dynamic microphone that was the only mic in the studio that never got used. So they were allowed to stick it up in the roof in the studio. And the only reason why it was up in the room is because they're like, oh, we don't use this one. So you can use that for your talkback mic. You know, I tried to buy one yesterday. They're ridiculously expensive now, of course, you know. But it's just an inexpensive dynamic microphone. And he, he, he put it up in the roof, he was using it for talkback. Everybody knows the story. Presses the talkback and, of course, the listen mic, all of the compression on it gives him this <laughs> drum sound that once upon a time I, w I would have hated and I was... You know what I mean? It's like all that... How many times, just to go for a second, how many times have you taken like a cassette? Remember the old like, you know, like little cassette players we had as kids and recorded the band, you know, the demo when you're in a band and you listen back and go, that's the best drum sound I've ever got. How can I do that? And now, now, now I'm just, you know, just thinking to myself, well, you know, maybe the thing to do is to stick the cassette player in the room when you're tracking drums use its internal mic, and it, it I've done it a couple of times, and it's a pain in the butt, and then dump it back into your DAW, and because it never lines up, of course, because it's on tape, but it's a whole unique drum sound. So I think the, the thing is, is like, I wish somebody had told me those kind of things, because all I wanted to do was make records that sounded like on the radio, which was super dry, close mic'd, in really expensive studios, almost passionless, and yet, in any environment, there's all these incredible opportunities to record. You know, you want a dead, dead sound? S sit outside, you know, put a mic on an acoustic guitar. You're not going to get any ambience in a field. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you don't need the $2,000 a day room. You can just go out there with a mic and go, maybe you'll get some, you know, some tweeting of some birds in the background. My... I think that's the, the sort of key, isn't it? It's like we, we forget, or at least I forgot. It's my own personal experience. All I wanted to do was make records that sounded like they cost a million dollars. And yet, now I know I don't need that. I just need a creative ear wherever I am and, and use the space that I've got. So if that's the one thing I wish somebody had told me or I'd realized when I was younger, because I go back and listen to some of that stuff and go, that was a great drum sound, but I thought it sucked. <laughs> You know, over the last couple of years, we've seen this big boom in bus-powered two-channel interfaces. You know, things are becoming smaller, uh, they're becoming easier to use, more affordable. You know, say I'm a musician, COVID hits, I'm out of work, I still want to continue to make music and be creative, entertain my audience. What's the bare minimum that I need to start recording at home? Mark, let's start with you. So, since COVID kind of kicked in, I've been emailed, called quite a bit to ask me what is the best setup they can have at home when they're starting. Now, some of these people kind of know how to run Pro Tools or Logic and some don't. So the key was, okay, you want the best signal you can. If they're not mixing it, then you don't worry about that. Then there's people that really want to get into it. So they want to understand what a preamp really does or a compressor does. So I would say when you're starting, you jump in obviously with something like an Apollo or the SSL2 plus um, that's specifically an interface but in Apollo you can use the whole um, what do you call that the mixer so in Apollo you can use the or for so Universal Audio you can use the console with the what do they call the unison the unison okay so for you Gotcha. So when you're tracking, you can use something like an SSL2 interface or an Apollo, Uni Universal Audio Apollo. But 
you know, the U, the UAD Apollo ecosystem allows you to kind of track into it and use the plugins as a front end versus an SSL2 is strictly just an analog preamp. So people were asking, what can I do to start? I would say an Apollo 8-channel or 2-channel is freaking great. Sounds great. You can use the front end on that. It will sound good. Compression. Start understanding what it's doing. Don't really worry about using condenser mics if you don't have a room for it. Be careful if you are just doing vocals. Uh, SM7s are a fantastic mic. Maybe buy a some kind of cloud lifter or whatever to make sure that the gain is better and that will help your preamp not work as hard. Um, don't worry about the upward gear until you really understand the philosophy behind that because once you get there you're going to want to buy the counterpart real version of the 1176 or the Distressor or the Tube Tech CL1B. But that's part of the love of it. Once you understand what it's doing in the plug-in version, you can jump over and buy the hardware and that will help you hear that. All right, guys, I want to move this over to talking a little bit about acoustic treatment for your space. Um, you know, are there any specifics to consider as far as what to listen and look out for and best remedies to take care of it? You know, something for somebody who's living in an apartment or a rental home situation, something that isn't too permanent, but something that can just get the job done for the time being. There's certain things that, you know, there will be bass build up in rooms. Typically, as you move further back from the speakers, of course, it, you know, the, the, the low frequencies have, have a greater chance to, um, you, you know, what's the word, you know, to, to build up and be Develop. heard, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah, develop. Thank you. So, you know, sitting on the couch at the back of the room is obviously going to give you a lot more kick drum and bass guitar than sitting like up against a pair of speakers. There's some logical things that you need to take care of. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, benefit from I don't know if you have. Do you have a cloud flying above you? A lot of people like uh, the clouds that can really, really help the listening thing. And I think if you do like one thing, you know, Carl, Carl Tatz talks about this and I agree with him really about the listening area if you can get this area where you're actually sitting between speakers to sound pretty darn good you're winning and if it means that you know the guy sitting by the fireplace in the back of your room doesn't have the best sound so be it it really does come down to that so i remember doing this interview with linda taylor who's this phenomenal guitar player and she built a studio in a house and in her listening position she had dialed it in like sitting between the speakers it sounded fantastic we listened to music we went through a whole bunch of gear she had some really nice mic pre's she you know as a guitar player composing music for film and tv as well as performing on film and tv the listening experience was really important to her and it sounded great between the speakers however it was like one of those rooms that was kind of long and there was actually you know all joking aside a fireplace at the other end and I was talking to her and we were talking about, you know, how she had done the work on the room. And then I made a joke and she goes, well, at the back there, it sounds pretty, pretty bad, pretty boomy and doesn't sound good. And I made a joke and said, yeah, but who cares about how it sounds in the back of the room? It actually sparked a whole gear sluts thread, that video. And somebody took it and said, Warren says it doesn't matter how your room sounds, which is completely taken out of context. But it's the sort of world we live in. What matters is where you're working. You know, she's sitting down there, 12 feet behind her. She's not actually going to be mixing 12 feet behind her. So, you know, it's one of those things. Get, get it sounding good where you're working. That is the most important thing. I think the cloud is something I've seen a lot of people starting to really, even in home studios now, are putting up. And that can be really, really useful. Getting reverberant stuff taken care of is just obviously something you have to do. If, you, if, you, if you're in a concrete box, make sure you can break that up so it's not just t -t 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 all over the place. And then make sure when you're buying or building stuff, you have good people to talk to. If they're going to make a phone call to Vintage King, for instance, to buy some stuff, uh, get somebody to advise you. You know, you need you need good advice on this. And like I said, there's some conflicting stuff, but the basics of it are quite straightforward. I mean, I can see Mark's done some good stuff and some panels on the wall. Maybe you can talk a little bit because I was I was blessed in my room. I inherited a really good sounding room. I, I assume you didn't. No, it was a vacant office. I think the people before there was an architect living in this house before. So they had the office space walk in. 
And going back to the Trinov and stuff, you know, I have experience with that specifically when I worked for Warner Chapel. The room I was in specifically was the worst sounding room you could have ever imagined. Just not even close to working, workable. It had panels in it. Somebody before me put the panels in. I'm not going to say anything about anything about what they did or not, but the room sounded dead when you walked in. I put up my ATC 45. You're thinking, okay, it's going to sound great. I played it and it was the most out of phase, backward sounding, horrendous sounding, but it was dead. Remember what Warren said about like, you can't really fix echo. And that is true, but it was a dead room and we put a Trinov in and it now granted you're putting something in your chain. And I was trained and taught by Doug Sachs to never put anything in line of your speakers because you're wanting to hear exactly the purity of what's happening. And same with Bill Schnee teaching the same thing about monitoring. Hear what you're doing and don't put anything in your chain. At the time, you don't want to put digital technology in because it wasn't great. But I knew it was so bad that it had to, I had to do something. So when it did its thing, obviously it was doing more than just EQ. It was doing phase flipping and everything it was doing was, if you looked at the frequency graph, that it was putting stuff in and out of phase all the way up the frequency graph, which means there was serious issues going on and nulls and problems other than just the EQ curve. So that really helped. Now, coming here and sitting in this room, this room's probably 20 feet by 18 feet. So it's a good size room. I didn't want to do terribly too much deadening. Now there's in front of the speakers you can't see behind my speakers there's bass traps and then I have a large monitor between it but be, be but next to me are these diffusers that I had made because I didn't want it to sound terribly dead there is a cloud above me but behind me is an inside a solid wall of glass which as you know is a nightmare to have going on but for me I I was like I just need to hear it and hear what's going on with my music and how it's translating and the thick curtains I have back there they are really thick velvet curtains do help and obviously anything above 1k is important for ponging and stuff like that um, there's another video I just finished editing that's coming out in a few weeks about monitoring and there's a bunch of tricks in there to just use your ears when you're walking in and how to know if your speakers are in phase or all these little things that I'm not going to get too deep into because no one will watch the video will <laughs> understand. But knowing that like Warren's in a very well-treated room, I'm in a great sounding room now, but coming in in the beginning was just like somebody's bedroom almost. And there's a large room with, you know, tile floors and drywall. And it sounds really good now. When we do our demos with one mic and we're doing demoing $300 mics or $1,000 mics, we use the Audient because we wanted to use, and it could be a SSL, it could be a UAD, it could be an affordable thing. But the idea is to say, look, here's an affordable interface with an affordable microphone and we're going to record a song in a couple of hours and let you download the multitrack so you can hear, does it sound any good? And I've never had anybody go, oh no, that doesn't sound good enough because we're just proving the point decently well treated not bad room with a decent e not bad microphone through a decently not bad interface really the only differentiator is the musicians playing and how good the song is you know so if you're covering freaking layla and you've got guys like steve magora who's now in toto singing it you know and playing keys on it of course it's going to be good you know it's not you know what I mean? It's I like the leveler that we're at. I mean, guitars is another thing. I know you're asking about speakers, but one my last thing I'll talk about guitars for me. When I was a kid in the '80s, kid kid in the '80s, you go to a music store. There was Gibsons and Fenders and Yamaha. The Yamaha was three hundred pounds, and the Gibson and the Fender were like eight hundred pounds and above. So I bought Yamaha guitars. Nowadays. 
There's Yamaha, Ibanez, a key, I mean, whatever. I, I can't even begin the list. There is thousands and thousands of things that you can buy in a price range, and the quality is unfricking believable. We live in such an amazing time for music and making music. And it's just unbelievable. You, you've got so much choice, and I don't care what country it's made in. Yeah, I do, I, I do like it when I've got a German mic. Makes me feel really good. Or an Austrian mic or a British console. Sure. American mics, American instruments. But let's be honest, it's a whole different world now. Um, so it's interesting because your question is so powerful now. With me waffling on about that last point, it really is the only differentiator is now, isn't it? The, the room thing... Sh we should probably do more videos on this, Mark. When your video comes out, it should be something we really get into. Because the reality is, a couple of thousand dollars, you can get interface, microphone, maybe even a pre in that these days. Get a nice mic pre for about two grand. You could probably get a mic to input interface and then a decent external pre if you want a different flavor to your interface. So say somebody doesn't have the means to treat their space where do you guys stand on mixing with headphones? <clears throat> I mean, it's a great question. And what's interesting is, like, I, I, I wonder if, what Mark will feel about this. I feel that once you've been mixing and you've been doing this for a long time, you can almost mix on anything, you know, within reason. You couldn't mix on something that re reproduce, doesn't reproduce, you know, the, high, the certain amount of high mids and low, low lows. But... I think I proved that to myself because the the very first ever live mixing in the box I ever did was with a pair of these blue headphones. And I'd never mixed entirely in the box using a pair of headphones ever before doing it live on YouTube. I'd always had the luxury of, you know, working here, maybe taking it away. I remember being... Um, I remember working in um, hotel rooms while I was making, you know, one record and then I was being forced, you know, quote unquote forced to work on tracks and do recalls and stuff on a pair of headphones in a hotel room at night. But I always had the luxury of checking. Like I could go in the next morning, going a little early before the band arrived, you know, plug in quickly, play the mix back, make some notes, go back to the hotel room at, you know, midnight and do a few tweaks. Well, what eventually happens is you get a lot of acquired knowledge and somebody gives you a pair of speakers, you go into a new room, no matter, you know, all the discussion we've had about rooms, and you know what to hear for. Plus, of course, you know, not only are you developing your, your abilities, you can go in and you can use reference mixes. So, of course, you can go in and you know how that should sound, especially if you've already mixed to a certain level. You can put on something that you, you've done, put it on and go, wow, there's no low end in this mix. But I remember putting like a sub 20 to 40 hertz on the kick. This room, these speakers aren't translating it. And it's not even so much something that you articulate. You just know it's going to happen. So if I'm starting again from scratch, because all you're going to hear is guys like us who've been doing it forever going, well, you know, you can mix on anything. You just have to, you know, know what you're listening for and all this kind of stuff. It's not actually a lot of very good advice for somebody starting off because we've got acquired knowledge. So honestly, I do think if you're starting off and you don't have a well-treated room, headphones is a good way to go. But when you're starting off, you don't know what you're listening for. So you do need to invest in something that's relatively, and this is a big word, relatively flat. I like tons and tons of different headphones. We've got the Odysseys like, um, We've got the like they're the three hundred and fifty dollar ones. We've got these, which are the same kind of price. I've got the Sony's. I've got uh, the Evos, the new ones that come they're like almost nothing. Um, I do think in a certain price range, if we're going to talk about products. The Audio Technica pretty much kill it in that sub two hundred dollar, even sub hundred dollar headphones. They're freaking remarkable. I have taken a unofficial poll over most people that if you haven't got much money to spend audio technica 
dominate in that lower price range. So if anybody wants to, and it's not taking anything away from the Odyssey, it's not taking away from Biodynamics. God, my 1990s are like, Mwah. I've got freaking Focals that were $1,400. They're the flattest thing in the world. However, we're talking to people here that $1,400 is basically their rumor treatment, their interface, their first microphone, you know. If you're looking at about $100-ish kind of price range, Audio-Technica kill it. And I'm not sponsored. I just think that's kind of universal. I hear that from every producer and engineer I work with. That, you know, if it's just a go-to, you know they're going to do the job. It's, but the reality is the longer you do this, the more you'll know what to listen for. If you, Whatever headphones you've got, whether it be your dad's or your parents' freaking headphones they got with their stereo, they will do the job. And the best way, really, is to use reference tracks. And trust your ears. One of the biggest problems I had growing up in the music is I didn't trust myself for years. And then it wasn't until I started working with really good people. I would do something. I'd play a mix to somebody and, you know, go, what do you think? And I remember Dave Jordan saying to me, what do you think? And I was like, well, sounds a little boomy. Couldn't get the bass guitar to sit properly. It sounds really, really uneven. And the high mids are super cluttered on the choruses, you know. And he's like, uh-huh. So you know what to think. It's like, oh, well, I'm not an expert. And he's like, dude, just trust your ears. Trust your ears. If it sounds boomy, it's boomy. If it sounds cluttered in the high mids, it's cluttered in the high mids. I think so many of us get a little bit daunted when we watch videos of production videos and mixing videos and all this kind of stuff and we feel like there's some kind of magic. All it is is that you start to hear things, yes, but you also start to trust what you're hearing and make really good decisions. And frankly, uh, I think you're intimating this, Dustin, by the question. You're better off with a decent pair of headphones than you are being with expensive speakers in a crappy sounding room. So that $100, $200 pair of Audio Technicas or whatever, Biodynamics, Sennheisers, there's lots of great companies, you know, is probably actually a better thing for you than being in your untreated, you know, room with a pair of $5,000 speakers. So, yeah, it's, it's a good one. But I think the reason why, the thing I wanted to sort of reiterate at the beginning is like when you listen to guys like us who, you know, have got a lot of acquired knowledge, we know what to listen for and we can get past any kind of situation. But I think at the beginning, a good flattish, because the word is ish, pair of headphones is going to do you a lot more good. And to be honest, it's probably where, you know, Sonarworks is going to win. Because Sonarworks is going to come in. It's quite affordable. I think the headphone version is like 100 bucks. Am I right? $98 or something like that. Take your $100 headphones, flatten it out with the, with the EQ, and that's a $200 solution where the best entry-level speakers I know are $300. So there you go. You're going to get flatter, better results for $200 than a $300 pair of speakers in a, in a room that doesn't sound good. To add to that, I, I think it's crucially important to know that we're in 2021 and that most people listen on headphones which is primarily why I think it's super important to be okay with doing that. I mean, Andrew Sheps mixes on Sony Professionals. Those are $108 headphones. The thing is, for me, in the beginning of COVID, I was up in Washington for three months, and I needed to find head. I had my entire analog chain, but it was mobile, to be able to do recall and mixes on the project I was on, but I didn't have proper monitoring and I certainly didn't want to bring speakers. So I hunted for headphones. I was on YouTube. I was looking, I was watching Warren's videos. I remember he used to comment while he was doing his, his live videos and, and he was pitching on the Focals and the blues. And for me, I wanted to find the best translating headphones that had really good low end. Because that's the hardest thing to find, the really sub-sub stuff, the, the super information, not just low boomy 100 hertz. So I went through a lot of different brands, too, and I ended up sticking with, you know, I had the Odyssey LCDXs or the ones I mix most of the time because it has unbelievable low end. But I actually use the Audio Technica that Warren talks about because everyone I know uses the same thing. I got called to do a Netflix film complete score mix orchestra. So you have to do super, super fine listening. And I said, yes, I'll do it, even though I didn't have speakers. 
and I mixed them on those Audio Technica headphones and the Audizy LCDXs, and no one knew until now that that's what I did. And to be honest, at that point, it was the same thing that happened when I first le- first time mixed in the box, which was it's totally doable. We need to really consider what's happening in the industry and understand and take advantage of being able to do things in any room in your house when you want to. doesn't mean you're leaving your $12,000 ATCs. It just means that you're able to adapt when you need to. So to tap off of what Warren was saying about for people that don't have the experience to hear, you start listening to content you like. And if you have a preference, obviously you like brighter stuff you you want to lean towards a pair of headphones that has a brighter sound or if you like low sub stuff all the time you want to lean towards that i would really really stand away from stuff that uses the harmonic harmonic kind of additive stuff like the beats headphones and even the bose speakers and stuff for your primary listening and listen to your favorite records and understand what they're doing because at that point it's the same thing that happened with the NS10s. Those things didn't go down low. So you didn't have any idea what was happening at 30 hertz on NS10s. And the only reason why Clear Mountain was able to do it is because he literally watched the driver almost pop out and knew that that was right primarily where you're the, the wheelhouse of getting low end. So you have to learn those in headphones. Headphone Most headphones don't go low. And most headphones don't go super, super high. And they will definitely start self-compressing. You just have to listen to it. And it's totally fine to stay in the headphones that you're at. Like I said, these guys, totally new, first time mixing. People are asking, why are you using in-ears? It's because I didn't want giant magnets on my head for the video. Because the the Odyssey headphones I have are literally like this big. I look like Princess Leia. So I was like, what do they have for this? And these sounded really good. It surprisingly has really good low end. And the top end's really bright, but I ended up listening to records that I liked and learned what the top end was doing and understanding that, you know, the, the S's and the breath should be balanced with the hi hat and should be balanced with the top formation of your snares and the top formation of your acoustics. And if you can focus on those kinds of elements, knowing that your balance is okay, you're going to be pretty safe. And obviously if you don't have the, the proper hearing experience, you can kind of look at a graph and say, Oh geez, 300 Hertz. There's a huge bell. Let's pull that down. A lot of people don't like to obviously use your ears, not your eyes, but we're in a technology world now where you need to use your eyes too. It just happens. And so by using graphs like that to change and adjust and using your $200, $300 headphones to do what you do, you you learn it. That's not saying that speakers aren't going to go to the wastebasket. I'm just saying that I'm totally fine doing records now in headphones. I don't enjoy it though. So that's the biggest thing we're going to talk about is part of that emotional connection and humanizing and all these things that make magic mixing is all the human element. That's why there's no algorithm yet that can totally nail mixing or mastering because you still have to apply the human element. So you always choose what you can honestly feel the best, coolest, most fun time doing. I, I do that with speakers. Then I do it with headphones in a different way, but it's just not as pleasing. But I do it because it lets me go upstairs and sit on my couch and have a great view versus being stuck in this little room. So that's another inspirational thing. So you got to remember. So headphones, totally agree. You just got to find the right feeling one. And sometimes you don't have the option or luxury to, but just know that you're going to not steer too wrong if people are actually saying, Those audio technicals sure do sound pretty good. They don't have to be $1,000 or $4,000. So I think at some point we've all tried to use our closet as a vocal booth, you know, using the hanging clothes as an ISO shield. When tracking in a less than ideal space, what are some foundational things that you can do during tracking to make your mix go a bit smoother? Um, You know, what are some good home studio hacks you guys have actually used with perhaps everyday unconventional studio items? Well, a lot of just to really quick, and then I think Warren should take it. Two things. Couches are enormously important and at the same time, enormously dangerous. 
Mm-hmm. So what it does is obviously suck out all the low end. But if you take it out, you're going to add a lot of problems too. So furniture is super crucial. The way you pan your speakers, how far you want, as Warren says, you want to build and let bass kind of develop is super important. But then you have to crank it a little louder, which could cause echo and stuff. But I, Ken Kelly has said many times when I've gone into specific rooms with him, and he's literally like, just tear out the drywall, leave the insulation, and put curtains in front of it. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but like there is no... That's why when you look at videos from the past 20 years when they shoot people in the studio, it's always the same ugly packing blankets over the gobos. If you ever noticed that, it's like you're in this gorgeous studio. Bill Schnee had this unbelievable gorgeous studio and he had these horribly ugly giant foam blocks the size of pool tables basically that he used as gobos they were super thick like 18 inches thick and they worked unbelievably well for vocals to be put in in a perfect formation you know it's not very pretty to use stupid stuff but i think you know if you're in your bedroom and you're facing it and your closet's behind you that, you know, you can open up your, your closet doors and then there's a basically a bass trap for you every time you're mixing. You know, a lot of dudes use shelving and books as diffusion because it's incredibly cheap. It looks great. It doesn't look like, you know, typical diffusion. And it works really well to diffuse the sound and stuff. But I think the most random you can be is probably the best so if one wall you have something like just you can't tell but this compression uh insulation behind the diffusion is different than my right side they just sound different there's less density on the left and that's just trying to random randomize things a little bit go ahead warren i did have my recording hat on because i thought you were saying recording hat but you meant recording hacks uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the uh, um, I'm sure I'm sure there'll be some people who'll know what that hat was. Um, yeah, um, I mean Mark's pretty much covering everything there um, in many respects. As far as general recording hacks, I think one of the things that I did when I first started. I wonder if this is pretty much everybody um, is always record room mics. You know, I remember. I remember doing an album where everything was stereo mic'd with room mics as well as a close mic. And it was, you, you know, I had three inputs. I could use them and I used them every single time. So I'd be like, hey, bass guitar, let's throw up some rooms, drums, throw up the rooms, piano, let's throw up the rooms. And I remember coming to mix and having like, you know, the, the, the you know, everything had stereo rooms. And I thought it was going to like make everything feel like it was in the same room. What it actually did was make everything sound like it was washed out and, and a total disaster. But the weird thing is, is used judiciously, that simple thing is actually quite useful because, yes, close mic, but then also grab some ambience. Like, you know, like we talked about earlier when we talked about, uh, you know, things that we wish we had known when we first started. And one of those things being that we're actually quite a lot further along than we think, you know, like, you know, the great, the great drum sound that I got in a garage that I absolutely hated, but now realize was great was because I just wanted to make the record that I heard on the radio. And of course that was made in the $2,000 a day studio. I just had the garage. Um, I think that that as a recording hack is just a good thing is like play to the strengths. You know, what do you have? You have a weird you know what what's what's unusual about your room what's unusual about the instruments you have you have a crappy acoustic guitar well weirdly enough crappy acoustic guitars have tons more hate the word but i'm going to use it vibe than really really expensive five thousand dollar guitars which sounds so perfect when you play a chord the crappy one that's all mid-rangey and honky usually fits better in the mix you know we're talking about the j160e which is a really dead boring sounding acoustic guitar when you're playing it sounds amazing with a mic on it because it doesn't have this horrible untamed boominess that you have to try and eq out or you have to spend 10 minutes moving the mic around to get that place where it's not going woo 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 a j200 sounds gorgeous when you're playing it I hate miking a J200. If a guitar player comes in with a J200, I'm just like, oh, no. 
and oh, I love the sound of this guitar. Of course they do. But it's horrible in a track. Horrible. Unless it's like the only thing. But if it's a pop song, why would you put a J200 with this extended low end in? So it's, it's the things that we all think of as being kind of limitations are usually what makes this sound individual and different. I joke all the time about my crappy Baldwin student model. It's not even a Baldwin. It's the Hamilton. It's the cheap, cheap one. It was like the one that, you know, was free with a packet of cornflakes back in 1960. I mean, it is a cheap piano and it barely stays in tune and it barely is in tune. But it's my crappy Baldwin Hamilton student model piano. You stick a, a ribbon in front of it or whatever mic you've got, a 57, it sounds totally unique and cool. And I think these days, one of the things is, is that you can open up any DAW and there's a thousand virtual instruments in there. There's usually some kind of drum program, some kind of piano sound, some strings, some synthesizers, all come for free in any DAW. What they don't have is your room, your instruments, your friends who can sing or play or your ability to do stuff. The creativity is all at your fingertips. So all you know, the best hacks I can say really is just use what's unique about you and the musicians that you've got. Um, Dave Jordan was a big one. He had a ton of really expensive, great guitars and amps when I worked with him, but he was never ever, ever, I'll say ever 50 times, dismiss what the musicians came in with. Because they would come in sometimes with like some weird kind of like bass, five string bass, active thing. And instead of doing what most engineers were doing, oh no, use my 1952 precision, it's amazing. He would be like, let's hear it. And so, you, you know, and, and a lot of these like metal records that we grew up on, and, and, and they were recorded on like really random stuff. I watched a video the other day about the Black Album and so much of it was recorded on a Spectre bass, you know, And but it was done with Bob Rock and you would think, assume Bob Rock is going to be like a Gretsch Shells with a Ludwig Snare. Yeah, exactly. You'd think of all these stereotypes about like, oh, this is the 1967 Marshall that was played by Jimi Hendrix on Monterey. You know, you, you, we all have these kind of ideas of everything. But no, he, it, it was a Spectre bass, which is not a cheap bass, don't get me wrong. But it's not the 1957, you know, pre-CBS, blah, 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 with the sun. Bob Rock was smart enough to go, that sounds better for this song and it ended up being on most of it's that's what i think smart people do is they, they they don't see limitations they see differences and creativity and uniqueness so i think you know we've 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 mentioned in different ways all of that kind of the how the forums can get you into this full sense of you know security and idea that you're never going to be good enough until you have an 87 a pair of ten thousand dollar speakers with uh, this, this, and this. You, you, you're sort of led into that belief, and it's no fault of any one individual, and it's no fault of any business model that has a forum. There's so many great pieces of information there, but we have to make a take a big pinch of, of salt with this, because you know, we talk about the D19, which is you know the inexpensive, dynamic microphone that the Beatles use, and we talked about it earlier. But we just have to remember, it is an inexpensive dynamic microphone. It might be worth a fortune now because they haven't made them in, in years and the Beatles used them and so now they're super popular. But it was never a expensive microphone and it's just an indication. What makes it good is it was the Beatles and they were writing great songs and they had great performances. And I think, so you, the, the hack would be... What do you have? What do you have that's different? What is unusual? Do you have a weird sounding room? Cool. Stick the amp on one end of the room, stick the mic on the other. Let's see what kind of ambience and craziness you get out of it. Um, do you have some strange instruments? I don't know. Try them out. Might, you might invent something really kind of cool. Then you've got a DAW with a million different tools where you can reverse things. You can, you've got multi-effects now that we only dreamed of using when we were kids. I'd go into studios that had three reverbs and two digital delays. And I was like, wow, this studio's incredible. It's got five effects units. Now you've got a hundred effects units available to you at all times. <coughs> it's creativity. The, the, the hack is, is to not worry about convention and just try some stuff. You know, uh, everything, 
that I can think of that I admire in recording was always some kind of weird, happy accident, whether it be double tracking, flanging, you know, Hughes drum sound, you know, whatever it is, they're all experimentation and happy accidents and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think the best hack I could say is just use what you have, experiment, push the boundaries, you know, yeah, because I know, well, I have acquired knowledge, so I know that that, you know, $129, that's plugged in, Evo 4 that I'm about to use over there is um, is is just as good. But for what I need, it's easily good enough. And the only thing that's stopping, you know, me making a great record is me, not the gear. So let's say you have a drummer over to track in your bedroom studio. Uh, the performance is perfect. The kit sounds great. But while you're in the mix, you know, you notice this nasty reflection, this room flutter happening. What are some good tools to use to fix or address that sort of thing? Well, it depends obviously on the issues, but it's interesting because I have found myself over the years telling people, you know, stray away from like presets in many situations because, you know, just because something's a preset doesn't mean it works. However, there's actually kind of a contradictory answer because the great thing about a lot of plugins that are coming out now, and I'm thinking of like the IK Multimedia Sunset Sound plugin, for instance, is we uh, we caught up a mix the other day. I think it was on a live stream. And I took the kick and the snare and I sent it to IK Multimedia's room sound and I muted my room sound and went between the two. And it was like identical. It was ridiculous. They'd obviously mic'd it the same way. We was, I, was in, I brought up the Studio 3. I think we had a pair of um, like... I think it was 251s or M49s that were miking the room, you know, whatever millions of dollars you can fly at the solution. And it was ridiculous. It literally sounded like the room. Yeah, because it had exactly the same decay, exactly the same EQ, because I was printing with no compression and no EQ, and I was using the mic prees, exactly how they did it. So my point is, it's like, simple. you got a kick and a snare, and your room mics have an issue. There's many, many solutions. There's one solution. I don't know how much the plugin is, but you want to sound like it was recorded in that room. There's that kick and snare in that room. <clears throat> and if, with Chris's, um, you know, that CLA Epic that came out, you know, that's that's his snare sound. We got really freaking close to it. The, you know, he mixed um, <coughs> some tracks on a record that I mixed most of a record, and he mixed three songs on it. And I remember the one thing I was like going, God, I liked his snare verb. I wish I got that. And I was driving in in the morning thinking, I'm going to try that on the plugin when I do the demo. And it got pretty damn close to what I liked about his snare sound. So there are, the reality is, is like, it's not really that difficult to get a good sound if you have some cool tools. Um, you know, I have no problem with using reverb plugins. Your rooms don't sound that great. I don't really have a problem with doing it. And the thing is, you can also get a little bit more creative because one of the problems that for most drummers are that are inexperienced is they don't know how to balance their kit. So they might go kick, snare, kick, kick, snare, symbols, 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 kick, snare. Now, of course, the room mics are almost completely unusable because all it is is hat and cymbals and little tiny kick and snare. Well, you know what? Mute the room mics, set up a reverb, and just send the kick and the snare and the toms there. And the, the cymbals will bleed, but they'll bleed in a lot lower level and suddenly you have better sounding room mics. I don't care what the... You know, to me, it's like I'm not precious about stuff like that. Um, I'm not precious about using samples if they have to be used. It's like whatever you have to do. By the way, Mark's lighting at the moment is absolutely superb. That's why I'm telling Dude. you, this thing, happens, the sun keeps, it just, it's bizarre. I, I didn't really, he, he, br Dang. he brought in a, he brought in a DP today. He's got like, it's uh, crazy. like the sun moves and then all of a sudden I'm glowing. Yeah. Like, like a oh. angel. so yeah, the point is, is like, whatever, you, whatever you want to say is like everybody through, through decades and decades of making music, we've always gone out of our way to try and make things sound good. And sometimes it it's a mic on the drum kit and the guy's an absolute genius and it's super balanced and it's amazing. Sometimes it's three mics and it's Bonham in a great room and it sounds perfect. And other times it is all the different tricks in the world. And then of course, the other thing we have to cut, a, cut yourself some slack. If you're doing a death metal record and the guitars are just like, <laughs> 
One mic on a drum kit is not going to cut it. Three mics on a drum kit is not going to cut it. If you want to turn the, turn the guitars down and let the ambience of the room take over, great. But as soon as you put in those huge walls of guitars, it's physics. The room and, the, and all of that energy on the drums is just going to get soaked up. So you have to do tricks. You have to do these things to make stuff work. And I think that this is something that, you know, we have to be aware of and have to cut yourself some slack on. Whatever you need to do to make the music sound great is whatever you need to do to make the music sound great. So to wrap a little more about what Warren's saying, let's say that you recorded a full drum set and there's a horrible sounding room behind it. You know, there's things like TransX really is a cool plugin. That's a Waves plugin. That's a super, super fast transient plugin. But if you do it the reverse where you're scooping out certain elements, that helps. D-Reverb plugins seem to help when you get some really bad nasal resonance. The FabFilter 3 EQ is phenomenal with the multiband dynamic EQ to save yourself from certain frequencies in rooms. Because usually with drums, it's based off the room or whatever is happening amplified to it. Um, going off a little bit more of what Warren was saying about replacing, uh, I remember doing a pbs series where i was recording a band in the studio and we ended up always running out of inputs so i always just gave the drums one overhead and sometimes i wouldn't if there was a brass section or something i would just be not miking the toms and so when you're in a daw you can literally see where the toms hit drag those down cut those out except for the toms and trigger those with a sample just so you have those elements same as kick drum or if somebody decides to record to an 8-track tape machine and they don't have enough mics and you just get the vibe you need and then you augment that with samples or whatever. There's just so many options. That Soothe plugin, which is, as Warren loves as much as I do, a life-saving master plugin. Probably is the best plugin of 2020, in my opinion. Because with that plugin alone, you can zone in on really bizarre resonance and hyper frequencies in a drum set or the room, and it can just tuck it out. And you instantly go, what did I do? I can't even, it's not EQ, it's not DSing, it's not doing this, it's just weird, like just grabbing harsh additive frequencies that build up and sounds like nasty. You know, I think it's it, it, it. Anything is achievable these days. Um, anything, you know, it's it's really fast tips. You know, every DAW now lets you convert audio to MIDI. You know, a lot of people, you can get real creative. I mean, now as a mixer, you're you're also a sound designer, and so if you have problems in your symbols, you can either a duck those symbols where the problems are at and put sampled symbols in those places or convert them to MIDI, do what you need to clean up just for the parts that need to be cleaned up. Because let's say somebody fell into the microphone on this perfect performance and you don't you can't put EQ on it or you can't do that. You can literally convert it to MIDI, find a, a room that's similar, symbol similar and cross that in on that part. So it's not just replacing it's not just skating or eqing you can literally kind of get creative and create sounds that you know the artist might not even know you did because they didn't know that there was a problem there in the first place all right fellas so prior to shooting this panel we had reached out to vintage king's instagram community to field some questions for you guys um let's start with let's start with this one so this comes from alton roundtree and he wants to know Outside of the preamps in my audio interface, when is it time to buy an external preamp? I think a good time is when you feel like you've gotten everything out of the interface you're working on. So if it is the SSL 2 Plus or an Apollo, you can totally use it. But you're going to run into issues of noise and sonic characters of it is not exactly right i mean in an apollo they don't have every preamp modeled so you might just want a different character for something i'd say a good time for that is when you start understanding the sounds for me i wasn't really paying attention to tube preamps until i went to la worked under bill schnee sat with doug Sachs, and started understanding that tubes were 
huge at creating big sounding music. So when I got myself a little money, I said, I'm going to buy a tube preamp. And what that did was create the sounds that I had in my head. Same as tube microphones, tube compressors. They all do relatively similar things when it comes to adding this size and dimension and character to it, a sound. So for that, preamps, you could go down the line of a knee preamp, an API preamp, a Dankin audio preamp, tube tech preamp, Personas ADL 600 preamp. All these are going to have different sounds. I think the time you start saying, okay, I'm ready to move on, you could buy a Warm Audio 1073 or a Neve AMS 1073, and they're going to sound similar. They might not be 100% the same, but they're going to have a sound, and they will sound different than, let's say, the counterpart of UAD using the software. So I say when you start understanding what it's doing, try it. And usually that means you're you're done using solid state or you're moving towards something like a grace or a millennial preamp, which is a very clean sounding preamp. And you use those specifically for noise issues. They have incredible fast response. So for something that you want incredibly quiet, very pristine sounding recordings, they might not be as lush sounding as a tube preamp, but then you would choose something like a grace or a millennial that has the power to do that. So that would be like that. If you feel like your noise is not right. All right, let's do one more here. So Life on DeGram wants to know, how do you make more time for producing when you work a full-time job? Oh, it's fantastic. Um, that's really fantastic question. And something gets asked a lot inside of uh, our academy because many, many people in there have full-time jobs. Um, some of them have we, have, we have all kinds of walks of life. We have people with night jobs. We have people with families and night jobs. Can you imagine how little time you have? Because you've got to fit your family and your kids in. So I, I, this comes up a lot. Uh, I think ultimately, here you go. I'm going to give you my non-Anthony Robbins response. I've, I've, I've read all of the wonderful self-help books, and I love that stuff, and I try to do as much as I possibly can and be a super positive thinking about everything. One of the biggest things I've learned from taking these kinds of courses and reading this kind of stuff is that to get out of the shame sort of cycle. Because one of the things I hear too much is people preaching things that they don't actually do. And so the first thing you've got to do is cut yourself some slack. Because it's, once you cut yourself some slack, hopefully that translates in, 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 in terms of America. Once you actually give yourself a break, cut, give yourself a break and realize that life and work and family and mortgages and rent payments and bills and all this kind of stuff are freaking a pain in the butt. And they take so much energy and they're so exhausting. Once you actually admit that to yourself, it gets a lot easier. So if you do get an hour and you want to do it, do it. Just cut yourself some slack. It's like, I'm tired of reading these things about people. Well, what I do is I, I get up in the morning and I have this book and I, I jot down all of these things and I blah, 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 blah. And I have the list and I work through it. It's a bunch of BS. Those of us that actually work in music and have families and stuff like that, we just do what we can, how we can. I think if you can get into that mindset of realizing it's okay, sometimes you just can't, don't have the time for it. And if you cut yourself some slack, give yourself a break, it will actually be easier to do it when you do have time. Making that New Year's, because we're probably close to the New Year's when this comes out, making that New Year's list of going to the gym and spending two hours a day doing music and all this kind of stuff is all really, really great. But don't expect to be able to keep up with it because life happens on life's terms. And if, as soon as you can accept that, you'll be amazed how much free time actually conjures up. Because if you're not doing what's on your list in the order it's supposed to be in, you will don't end up doing anything. You get paralyzed. You're all like, oh, my God, I'm a failure. I read this self-help thing and it said that I had to get up every morning at 6 a.m. and write this notepad. Ugh, that stuff drives me nuts because you know what? Life happens. 
and people end up having to work overtime and then they sleep in the next morning because they had to work for two hours late on their job. All of this stuff that happens to us and then suddenly they're a failure and they didn't... Cut yourself some slack. Do work when you can. Make this something you enjoy. And if it's something you enjoy, you'll end up actually doing more of it.